Welcome to FOSS North, the virtual edition. We would like to thank all our sponsors and partners in this difficult situation. Our gold sponsors, Luxoft and Ansible by Red Hat. Our silver sponsors, ITRS Group and Make It Right. Our base sponsors. Our partner projects the open source community and the region of Gothenburg. And a huge thanks to our awesome community. This would not have been possible without you. So now we have uh, Ron uh, Munit coming on stage who will talk about uh, minimal systems and not so minimal systems. Uh, you have one hour including Q&A Ron, so you have the stage now. So hello everyone. Uh, my name is Ron Muniz. I'm from the PSCG. And today I'm going to talk to you about a very minimal Linux system. Now I give this talk every now and then. And usually I start it by actually going ahead and like asking who has experience with one or who has experience with two. And then people would either raise their hand or not. But today it's going to be a little more challenging because we're doing it virtually. So I'm just going to go ahead and usually I just play with it and I select it's like, I will, you will see the slides later and you will see that you, there are like over 100 slides and most of the work is going to be on the terminal anyway. Uh, however, usually yeah, there are several places we can take this talk. So this time I will be a little less democratic and I will talk about some things that I did not talk in one of the previous time I did uh, talk about minimal systems. So this talk is going to be about taking a kernel and building a very minimal RAM disk and the principles for it to actually work. It's going to be busy box based. I'm going to talk about the terms for those who are less familiar with it. And we will conclude by adding some components and discussing strategy for how to make things more or less graphical trade-offs and the like. So a little bit about myself. Um, I am working in the PSCG. It's a company of consulting and training. Also done a couple of startups. Um, do a lot of security and mobile, but I will jump right to business and not talk too much about myself. And let's skip some clients. Uh, we do a lot of things, okay? But most of the things that we do are related to embedded development and I would say to all kind of like real-time operating systems and a lot a lot a lot of Linux and when I say a lot a lot a lot of Linux I mean everything that is Linux kernel based so what is Linux and what is like Android for example both are Linux kernel and then they diverge the moment it boots and I will talk about it also like in the lecture so all of these phases and the slides will be published so you can do them one by one. And you can also ask me for like more content. Uh, last week was the first time I ever uploaded like a video to YouTube and being inspired by last week's lightning talk of Foss North. And uh, when I extended a little bit my 10 minute lightning talk and added some content about the Yocta project. So if you're interested, I will do it here too. I'm happy to, okay, write to me. And I'll give you again the details at the end of the lecture and feel free to do so. So in order to reproduce the system we're building on, the host system is going to be uh, an Ubuntu with these uh, packages. You can auto set it, you can use a VM and uh, the links here will be updated. What we have here is something that is almost the same but with a little bit of other focus on the user space and a little bit of older kernel version. I will, uh, send, I will update the slides and both have these links. I also send you the links for what we actually do today, okay? So because I'm, there are questions, there are QA, I'm very open to also answering questions and adding some examples as we go. So the methodology here is going to be to go and do the following things. We're going to first show how to get the kernel source, talk very, very, very quickly about how the kernel boot. And then we're going to reason, especially for those who have never seen 
uh, how Linux boot or built a Linux system uh, by themselves, we're going to actually see how user space that we love and like comes to life and what are the possible customizations on the way? What, is the, the, what are the principles? Because the possible customizations are pretty much impossible to come, all right? So the first thing we're going to do is to get the source. So I will show slides, although usually I like just going like to the website. If you go to kernel.org right now, and feel free to do it, you will see something like this. You will see latest stable kernel is 5.5.13, and then you will have several versions. We only have one hour, so I will not talk about them too much, but I will say some of the important things. If something is stable, it pretty much means you can count on it. If something is an RC, it means it's a release candidate. So now it's 5.6 RC7. It means that kernel 5.6, when it will be the next stable kernel, right now the stable kernel is 5.5, .5, is now under the seventh round of testing, which means that soon enough we're going to have 5.6. Usually they are anywhere between six and eight, uh, but it's an arbitrary number of release candidates. If you want to ship, Linux with your device, or you want to ship a distro, it doesn't need to be an embedded device. It can be uh, any component that you have that maybe is used on server or on your desktop or so on. Then you are most likely, you will most likely want to use a long-term release. And under the FAQ tab of kernel.org, you will see what are the different um, what are the different releases and candidates? So you have here all kinds of information about what is what, and then you have the releases. So on the releases, you can see how long some kernels are going to be supported. And I'm not going to get into it, but uh, you can see, for example, that 4.14 is going to be supported much more than 5.4. Why? Because of all kinds of decisions. Happy to elaborate if you're interested in. So if you want to have kernel support for like, critical fixes, but not necessarily anything you need, like new features and so on, it could be safe to go on such a long, long, long-term support kernel. All right. So um, back to uh, the kernel. How do we start? If you know what release you want, let's say the stable, you're going to use Git in order to get it. An example can be if you go ahead and clone everything, it's going to be like today around two gigs, I think. And uh, you can get just a particular branch and do a shallow clone as follows. And you can figure out what are the different uh, tags, do all kinds of, uh, of Git commands in order to verify things before you actually download, but we're not going to get to that. And the idea of the kernel is going to be like this. If you want to play it safe, just go for the main line for the less is stable. But for every version, you're going to have several um, tags. I do not say branch deliberately because like on the stable tree, you're not going to have branch. Developers can have branch on different trees. Like the Git workflow in the kernel looks a little bit different than what you know in uh, many places these days. So let's say if like the current uh, version or the current stable version was 5.1, then the next release would be 5.1, 5.1.2 and so on. And after sometimes, a list of features that will be taken from another Git tree called Linux Next will be decided as the new features that will go into the next stable kernel that would be 5.2 in this example, if the current one is 5.1. So what is going to happen is that there's going to be something called the merge window, a couple of weeks where people say, hey, we get this in, we don't get this in. And then once the features have been decided, there are going to be testing cycles as I explained before, uh, AKA the release candidate. So you need, in order to make Linux, you need to decide what is the version that you want, OK? So this is what you're going to build. And how you're going to build it, we're going to get into it very soon, OK? Now, what happens when Linux boot? I'm not going to get into too much details. Basically, um, both in PC and in embedded, in whatever architecture, there's going to be some bootstrapping code. There is going to be a boot ROM that will jump somewhere, that will jump somewhere, that will jump somewhere. And there can be a little bit less of some words. But in like PC world, one of these some words is going to be something like grub. In embedded world, many times it's going to be uboot. 
Um, and the idea is that this bootloader that is also like a program that's being loaded is going to go load uh, Linux or another operating system into memory and boot it along with other things that it may and will load and boot them into memory. So in x86, for example, the BIOS or the EF5 program is going to go ahead and grub is going to be loaded from there. And it will go ahead and search in a menu, for example, uh, for a kernel and initial RAM disk. On ARM devices, on embedded devices, you're also going to be something that is called a device tree that helps you to enumerate the hardware. OK, I'm going to give the example here on x86. And once you load the kernel, the kernel is going to do all kinds of things. And at the end of all this kind of thing, it is going to spawn a kernel in its thread. So let's have like a quick look, for example. Uh, if I went to the source tree, this looks something like this. Uh, this is a kernel source tree, hello. And if I go like to init and look at main.c, we will see a function that is going, going to be called after a lot of initialization. And here we have these two guys kernel thread with a function kernel in it, and another kernel thread is case for D, that never mind where it is right now, okay? Now, this guy kernel in it is going to do all kinds of things. And one of the things that it's going to do is going to try and run the init process. Now, there are several such options. I will explain some like uh, empirically as we see, but here you can see in the text all kind of like interesting, Texts like s bin init, fc init, bin init, bin sh. And if everything is bad, it's going to say, hey, no working init found. Okay. Now, what is this init? Actually, I'm not going to go by, talk about the details, but what happens is that this kernel thread that we have here that we create that runs kernel init. Let me get back to it. So it's going to have a it has like a very interesting characteristic. First, it's like complete part of the kernel lies in the exact memory mapping of it and so on and so forth. And if we look at the code, and I'm not going to do it now, you're actually going to see that we have an exec VE. Now, this exec VE is going to be after a transition of the mode for this process, like to user space. And this is going to be actually a process a user space process. As you can see, if you go ahead and do like PSAX on your machine and this guy, so you see the PID is always going to be one. There can be any type of command here. And everything that you see here, for example, this K thread D is K thread that, everything within brackets are kernel threads that run in the kernel itself, okay? So this is what kernel init does. And what happens after it is that you can do whatever you want. With the right configuration options, you can go ahead and have a script. Have like a, a, a script with a shebang, like bin bash, whatever, and execute something. We're going to look at it and we're going to see that. You can have a system D in it. You can have just a program that connects and prints uh, something to the screen that toggles the LED that does whatever. This is user space and you can do whatever you want, okay? So basically, in order to do some things that are more interesting, you would want to actually be able to do all kind of file operation, like opening a file, writing to it, doing Yoctel and so on. So for this, the kernel provides an API, an interface that is called VFS, the virtual file system, which means that every time you have this open, read, write and so on, then, user does not really care what is the underlying file system or driver or the implementation. They are just going to use this API and that's it. Now, in order to use this API, they would probably need to have the concept of a file. Now, in order to have the concept of files, the kernel needs to have a way to know like the concept of uh, files in both ways, the way it manages it, it internally but for this, it needs to go ahead and have what is known as like super block and 
registered file system, and we're not going to talk into this now. I talk about it in my kernel courses quite a lot. But what is important is that the user that wants to open need to uh, have like a path to work with, you know, slash something, slash bin slash ls. Now, in order to do that, we need this slash. And this is called root file system. Now, the root file system is going to be a place where we can work with that is run like this init from the root file system and do something. And it can be in all kinds of places. It can be on a RAM disk. It can be on a physical device. It can be on remotely using NFS. It can be a lot, a lot, a lot of things. Now, one of the most common things that you will see, for example, in all of the general purpose dispros, modern dispros, like Ubuntu, like Fedora, like Red Hat, and so on, is that you're going to have an init that is going to run some executable or a shell script that does all kinds of things and call other executables. It will usually load all kinds of modules in order to make your hardware work. And then it is going to switch root in or into a richer environment. For example, the one is going to be like on the root file system that you see when you look at slash, like in your dispo. So it is optional, but it's not, it is not obligatory. When you go, for example, to rescue mode, a lot of time you just see part of it. So this part of it is usually being done in the concept of finite from FS, that is just going to be a file system that is compressed in this way or another. It's very, very, very common to have a CTIO archive and compress it in all kinds of um, compression methods. Uh, you can not compress it, it's just okay. And you can uh, choose which methods you support. For example, you can say, hey, I want to support only compression of XZ. And then if you have a GZIP, then the kernel will not be able to decompress it in it from FS. Now, in modern systems, yeah, I will show a demo later. Most of them use something like uh, make in it from FS, and then you can unmake in it from FS. They also have um, other very low level code like U code and things like that. And I'm not going to talk about it too much. Now, speaking, for example, on Ubuntu, which is the system that I'm running now, the system boot process looks like this. Let's say that we have VFI, there is a grab program that is going to call, be called grab something.efi. Then this grab program, that is actually, if you look at the file of it, it's P. It's like EFI programs look like the portable executable, like the Windows format, those who are like to research all kinds of file formats. And it's going to actually be the bootloader that loads the kernel. And the, it's going to also load uh, init from FS. The kernel is going to be boot. The init process is always one. It's going to run an init from FS that is going to have an interpreter that is busy box, which is exactly what I'm going to do in the second part of this lecture. And this interpreter is going to do all kinds of things and it's going to switch root at the end. So if we look at the init from FS, it would look something like this and I'm not going to get too much into it, but there are some interesting files to note over here. Sorry about this pop-up. All right, now that we've done it, I want to actually go ahead and show you another type of system. So this other type of system that I'm going to build will look something like this. So I'm going to have this guy here and I'm going to use QEMU with all kinds of parameters. Don't, it doesn't matter really what the parameters are, okay? And I'm going to be able to run faster by doing enable KVM, but I don't have to. I could append all kinds of options to the kernel, just like your bootloader does, okay? And I can decide, for example, if I want to have my console that is what is like the main place to read from the screen, for example, from serial and to write from the keyboard, for example, from serial. I'm going to do like all these kind of things. I will define all kinds of parameters and then I can see things. Now, example for this, system will be this. I deliberately put this print case in case I will explain what is like the frame buffer console, okay? But this is my Linux system. It prints the pscg.com and I can do all kinds of things, ls and ps, and I can do some things like uh, 
uh, abuse my system and may and show that I have that I have the ability like to write to the screen. Okay, so I can do all kind of these things. So this is what I'm going to build. Okay, and in the same way, I can also go ahead and, for example, do a console redirection, run a non-graphical mode, and that's it. Okay, in this particular example. And I can go ahead and just uh, do this as well. So we're going to learn about the concept of like how I built this and how I did like very minimal things. And later talk about considerations when we want to build things. So our distro, we're actually going to build a distro here, just like Debian, just like Ubuntu, okay? It's going to be a kernel that I took from kernel.org. I took it last week. It's the exact recent version of 5.6 RC7 I showed you earlier. With BusyBox that I mentioned that other distros use. And that's what we're going to do. OK? Maybe later we'll talk about debuggers. I think usually I talk about this in this particular talk. I will keep it to 50, 55 minutes, and I will skip it, although it's easy. When you go over it at home, there are scripts for everything, so you can go ahead and do things fast. And there are a couple of branches in the Git repository. And like the current master branch is just going to go and do things very, very, very easily, but also very bloated. It's going to take a default configuration of the kernel, add to it some debug snippets, so you can use a kernel debugger and a kprod and so on. And then Things are easy, especially if you just want to use console without other things. Okay, so this is what you can, are going to do, and I'm going to analyze the script very soon. This is one example. Okay, so you can see by the names that one of them is fetching the kernel tarball, is doing wget to this guy. The other thing is going to actually build the kernel. So instead of dot slash configure, make, make, install, we're going to have a, a config file that we can generate graphically with make menu config, make X config, and so on, or use default configuration. Then we're going to do make. And we can also, if we want to build all kinds of modules, we can install modules and uh, so on. Now, run KVM is a script in order to go ahead and do what I did from the command line, that is run QEMU in a way that is like, um, you don't need to type it yourself, and fetch BusyBox and create initial run disk are going to actually go and build BusyBox and create init and create the initial file system. Now, the reason I put this one in brackets, optional. And this one here, run KVM twice, is that if you go and experiment, then the first time when I like to demo these kind of things, I like to show you what happens when I do not have an init RD. So let me do it very quickly here. Let me take one of these running, and I'm going to get rid of the init RD here and of all the parameters. So no init RD. OK, I did a mistake because I need to at least have the console. So this was a mistake. I need to tell him what is the console that is, where to redirect input output to from. So this is what I have. And now I forgot to remove the initial RAM disk. I will explain what I put and like the boot animations and so on. Um, OK, so look what we have here. We have the text that we saw earlier, run it, bin init as init process, run it, see init, ta, 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 ta. Boom, not syncing, no working init fine. OK, so you see this penguin? This is the boot logo, say hi. And the reason it exists even before I had like a root file system is because the kernel draws it. The kernel does a lot of things. 
uh, you'd be surprised that it does all kind of things that are even like connected like to like deciding what is like the video mode. If you remember that you gave like VGA ask para, maybe I'll show it later. And you say, hey, check your video mode. Then you will see that um, this actually comes from the kernel code, okay? Now, you know what? I can go ahead and show it like very, very, very quickly. VGA equal ask. I'll get rid of this mode. And then you see this message booting from ROM, press enter to video mode availables. This is even before the kernel is being decompressed. So I can go ahead and like uh, see what are the modes Oops. or do scan and decide like what is the mode that I want to run in. For example, a very bad and ugly mode, okay? All right, so back to our slides. So this is what we're going to show. Now, how do we build a kernel? It's actually very, very easy once you have like the scripts. So the important thing is to know the steps. You go to the kernel directory after you, of course, uh, unpacked it. You create a .config file. For example, for the current architecture that you have, you just do make and def config. O means change directory of the output to another directory. You don't have to do it. But it's nicer if you want to look like at the code to not have code and data and, uh, and the executables like together. However, there are a lot of auto-generated code. So if you do these separations, many times people do that and say, hey, where is the definition? Where is the include file? Where is the C file? It's because auto-generated code is going to go to the output code uh, folder. Now, you're going, if you want, to add additional configurations. For example, here I added all kinds of things so that I will be able to use Vertio and all kinds of guest virtualization extensions. And then you build with make, very, very, very simple. Now, when you want to run it, you need to actually have a kernel that is built. If everything worked well, you're going to have a VM Linux file, which is going to be a potentially a huge file, but on our mini Linux, we're going to make it very slow instead of a couple of hundreds of megas, like around, two megs for a, for a 32 bit and around the eight megs for, for 64 bit. And there's going to be a compressed file under arc, the name of the architecture. And when you have name of the architecture, I'm not going to talk about it too much, but what you're going to have is, do I have, is this, like under arc, have a look. Take five seconds to have a look, for example, x86, ARM, ARM64, and under x86 is both the code for x86 and x66, 64 bit, okay? So the compressed file is going to be over here. So if you want to debug your kernel, you want to keep VM Linux in touch. There are many debug things that you can do, many debugging things that you can do also without having VM Linux, but if you want source code debugging or to refer to all kinds of symbols, you may definitely need to. There are other things that will make your life easier in debugging, eh, harder in debugging, and eh, like KSLR beginning kernel 4.9, but I'm not going to tap into it right now. If you heard me and, and uh, start to thinking, okay, my next task is debugging a kernel, then I said this sentence for you because I always get asked this and for a good reason. Okay, so what happens if you run either this or that? It's the same, you can run this, you can run that. So what will happen if you don't use a RAM disk is this panic that we show so earlier. So what do we need to do? We need to have an init file on a RAM disk that will populate. So how do we do it? We're going to get busybox, configure busybox. Now in our configuration, we're going to use the default configuration and make sure that busybox, the executable that will be generated is going to be static. Why? Because otherwise, and it's a good exercise, you will see very soon that nothing runs because it will have dependencies on libraries. But for that, it needs a loader. And for that, you need to configure a lot of things. And doing all this kind of thing by hand can be annoying and can be hard. So long story short, this is one of the reasons why there are build systems like build root, like Docker project, like Android, and so on, to take care of that. But to make it, we're just going to make it a static executable. It will run everywhere that has the same architecture and knows to load elf files. 
and things will be okay. So we do that and pay attention. We build and we install whatever we build, I'll show what we build, into weak RAM disk and install. What else do we do? We create all kinds of folders that we want. We actually don't really need all of them. You can live without proc, you can live without sys, you can live without dev. And if you configure your init file properly and like not with the default busy box uh, uh, expectations, then you will see that you can live without dev. Otherwise you'll have a lot like a, of annoying uh, garbage going to the screen all the time, but we'll not get into it now. So you can create whatever folders that you want. And what you are likely to do is mount all kinds of things, maybe print some things like the banner that I did. And when you run this init script, it's going to have PID1. This is what is going to be run from the kernel that we, like we showed earlier. This is what was not funded. This is why we panic. So what's going to happen here is that we're going to do exec, and this is super important, to slash bin slash sh. Now, usually I would ask now, what would happen if there was no exec? And then I will wait for the answer, but I will give you the answer like now, because I can't see if somebody answers it. What's going to happen now, if we remove exec, is we're going to panic. Why? Because init is going to finish its execution and it's going to try to exit and you cannot kill PID1. So we will have a kernel panic. So whatever you do in the init, unless you just want to do it one time and then a suicide, then uh, go ahead and do exit. Make sure there is, the thing does not exit. So here, if we do just this, once I exit the shell, then I will panic as well. Unless I, I have like a way to respawn myself and I'm not going to get into it right now. Okay. So what happens if I want to have kernel modules? What are kernel modules? When I build a kernel, as I mentioned, I can go ahead and now I'll just uh, show you something very quickly. Uh, okay. So I can go ahead and have this nice VM Linux file that in this particular case is about five megs. Okay, this is not what I had in mind. All right, now pay attention. If I want to go and build everything in the kernel, for example, or some of the things in the kernel, there are a lot of subsystems. Now, many times the distro maker wants to build one thing, but the hardware of the user will not really need all of this. So why have all this bloat and have everything loaded? So the idea is to go ahead and you can go and see in your own distros under lib, sorry, mo uh, modules and then the kernel version. You can see that there are a lot of KO files. For example, if I want to see the Intel graphic cards, then I have a kernel object file, it's a loadable kernel module. Now I can go ahead and configure the kernel so that this one will be built into the static image itself. So the idea is that you can go ahead and I'm not going to talk too much about kernel configurations, but the idea is that you can go ahead. It's only because like we don't have too much time, right? And the kernel configuration looks like this. It has like tuples. Usually it's going to be either have yes, commented out or no value. For example, I support, I do not support kernel gzip, but I do support kernel xz, okay? And um, I can go, this is for the kernel compression itself, not for the round disk. And I can have something equals modules. In this particular case, I do not have anything equals modules. Everything that I built in my configuration is statically built into the kernel. However, if we go ahead and look at, for example, boot, config, whatever, it's 
sorry. You will see that we have a lot, a lot, a lot of things that are uh, going to be with equals M. So M means that it's going to be a loadable kernel module that is going to be built. And you will need to install it in order for it to go to slash lib modules and so on. And hopefully, if you know how to install properly and build things properly, uh, be handled automatically by um, that mode and by mod pro. So the idea is that when we build, if we want to build for our kernel modules, we can go ahead and do something like modules install. Okay. And this is like the syntax. So after that, after I do modules install, then we're going to have under lib modules and the version, whatever I want to have. However, if I want to make it not for my host, but rather for wherever I want my RAM disk to be, for example, RAM disk WIP, then I need to provide these parameters. So I'm not going to talk into it too much. There are also kind of dependencies, but you want to know that how to do this kind of thing, okay? So this is for loadable kernel modules that were built inside the kernel tree. And for loadable kernel modules that are built outside of the kernel tree, that is you make an a lower module not inside the kernel tree, then you're going to refer the build system to it and there is a, an easy way to do it. So this is how it is. Like you're going to say obj-m in a make file. I'm not going to teach you now. I'm teaching it in my kernel courses and my embedded courses and so on. Uh, you do it like add the module and then you change the directory this you, to wherever you built the kernel. It's very important. You need to have a dot config there and all kind of uh, header files and so on. Tell the build system that this is the working directory or your make file is and build modules and then you can install it very easy. Other things that I can go and do is take partial configuration. It's called config fragments in many build systems like in the Octo and not have like an entire config file like I showed you before, but rather have partial configs. For example, if I want to go ahead and have a, a debug fragment, what a, a, to add K probs and so and uh, things like this. Let's have an example here. So if I look at the kernel configs and I want to look at my kernel debug fragment, it's very, very, very short. Trust me, even if it's the first time that you see it, this is maybe like a 15 lines and like the minimal config is going to be like 500 lines, okay? So here we're going to have all kinds of things like, hey, we want to support KGDB and our architecture supports KGDB and we want to have KDB and we want to have F-Trace. F-Trace you may know from user space, from all kinds of tools. If you do, for example, Android application development, then this is like the, the tracer that you're going to have. Uh, K-probs and so on and so forth. So I can go ahead and use a merge configuration and see all kinds of things. There are all kinds of scripts uh, that are going to be used for merging configuration, for diffing configuration. And actually I, show, I, sh I showed how to use it in, I added just before the talk, let's see where it is. By the way, this URL is likely to change, but I added a, a configuration, a, a configuration repository that explained in its commits and its branches, all kinds of phases you want to do when you want to build something small step by steps or build everything very bloated and then go back. So here, like I have like all kinds of configuration examples, even if you never use it, you can learn from it. And the usage of how to use like a different config script. Okay. Now, when you want to build, you're going to override the dot config file. This config is super important. And after that, you're going to wait for the build to end, and then you can boot your uh, mechanism. This crossed out things because we don't have time for that. So what do we have so far? We want to have a way like to build a kernel and its features to build user space tools, to pack them together, 
to handle dependencies if there are, for example, if I want libc. Maybe I want to select all kinds of graphic frameworks. Maybe I want to have a packaging system and so on and so forth. So if we want to use some things like that, then things become a little bit challenging. So for that, we would want to probably use um, a build system like the Yocto project, okay? Now, some of the things that you want to do to have like a minimal build. So let's me summarize what I've done so far and the relevant script, okay? So the first thing I did is to take a tarball and get it and unpack it, okay? In order to start working with it, there is NF setup. Those who do Android framework development will understand that I took the name from there. And these are all kind of like variables, okay? So we need to source it before you start. So I'm not going to do it now because we're short on time. We're going to fetch the kernel and then we can build the kernel, okay? So to build the kernel, we will have this. Everything, this is exactly what we have in the slides, okay? And this is a little bit of a change because I use a tiny config, which is what I'm going to show you now. And not the current tiny config, but I call the tiny config, it's something that I build step by step. I'm going to have here like creation of configuration file under the kernel output, and then I'm going to make, then I'm going to create a RAM disk. Now look what's happening here. The RAM disk that I'm going to create looks like this. I'm going to get BusyBox. And in BusyBox, I'm going to build it with a default configuration. And I'm going to go ahead and, um, and I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to, um, to make sure that it's static and I'm going to install it. And installing it will create something under WIP RAM disk. And this something will look like this. A lot of links that point to slash bin busybox, okay? And there's going to be an executable called busybox that is going to be static. Okay, after this, look what I do. I'm going to create empty directories. I don't have to do it. This is just what I do. And after that, we're going to do the following thing. We create an init file, and this is the context. What do we do here? I mount procfs, sysfs, debugfs, if I created them. I echo a message in colors. I do enumeration of dev slash dev, I populate it. Sorry that I don't explain those who are not experienced with it. Feel free to ask me a question afterward. I'm going to export uh, some string that will be automatically executable once I execute the busybox shell. And I'm going to, uh, this is a trick that I can either do or not do and execute uh, directly, but I'm going to execute a shell. This is something to make busybox less qui uh, more quiet about all kinds of things, okay? Then I'm going to make my init executable. And then I'm going to repack the RAM disk. What does repack the RAM disk do? So repack RAM disk is going to create a CPI or archive and then gzip it. And this is my friend, what I provided the kernel. So this dish init rd parameter, okay? So this is what I did. And I did it by actually going ahead and, and configuring all kinds of things. Now, if we look at, Um, build kernel.sh, we will see that what I build there is def config, which is very bloated, and kvm config that is not really necessary, just needed if you want to use Vertio for a kind of thing. And I add to it with the merge config the kernel debug ferment.config. But the important thing is that I have a dot config and the kernel like runs on it. And I need, of course, to make the kernel work, all right? 
So I need to carefully craft the features. So let's go and talk about some of the features. So, so far, we managed to build a kernel very easily, build root FS easily, run QMU either with no graphic mode, means without the window or with the window, okay? It doesn't require too much, except for knowing which device is the console. So when I want to build a distro, I have two options. One, start from nothing and add to it until it works. Two, start from everything and remove things until it's small enough. But this way or another, it's very important to understand the basics. Okay, the basics are very hardware dependent, but actually they're pretty much the same. Some examples. If I want to have a display output, then I need to know that if I'm like on x86, I do not even need like to know the graphic card uh, internals. If I know how to work with BIOS, for example, I can go ahead and use BIOS 0x10 services or BIOS 16x uh, services to get graphics and keyboard. Now, we don't have enough time, so I'm going to not explain it too much. But basically speaking of graphics, there are a couple of drawing paths. The display is like the screen, wherever I see like the nice uh, drawing and so on. And the hardware is what's going to project to it. But I need to feed the hardware. So it's going to be either with graphic processor drivers or with the BIOS. And I can either draw directly to either of them or use a concept that is known as frame buffer. So a lot of the configurations have to do with the frame buffer. So this is drawn directly. This is using the frame buffer. And if I want to work with a console and a frame buffer and see like this boot animation, this logo, not boot animation that I, that I showed, boot logo, then I'm going to need to use a console. There's also DRM, I'm not going to go into it right now, okay? So if you want to see graphics in Linux, you need to know the hardware and you need to know your requirements. Maybe you just want to have input, output and serial cables, that's okay. And then you need the following configs, VT, a virtual terminal, TTY, and a list of 8250, for serial and console. If you want to use the display and keyboard as the BIOS, as the, as the console, then you need to either uh, use BIOS function, or you can, if you want to use frame buffer interface, then you need to configure a frame buffer interface. For example, to have a logo, you need frame buffer. A, a, a splash information called P splash that I'm going to show a little demo of also requires frame buffer and so on. Okay, so you need to know the hardware. Now let's look what we need, for example, if we just need like monitor and keyboard uh, console. So in Q and QEMU. In QEMU, there is a BIOS of CBIOS. The serial interface is going to be TTY0. And there are all kinds of display graphics. So when I boot, I can go ahead and check all kinds of parameters. For example, I can say, hey, I want to use VESA. And for this, if I want to actually be able to use it, then the kernel needs to also support it. Or I can say, hey, I just I don't want any graphic. I just want to do things like this. Okay. So how do I start the build? And we do not have too much time, so I'm going to get like to the end like very soon. Okay. The easiest way to start like from nothing is with either all no config, that is make all no config, that creates a configuration that does all no, of course, from the kernel uh, build directory, or tiny config that is pretty much similar, but it's idea is to have minimal kernel size. And then I'm going to start and add all kinds of things. The idea for debugging will be to have all kinds of messages and make sure that my components are included and do what they want. And in order to even start and see them, I need to first enable printk, which is the way to enable this. If I want any IO with keyboard display or serial, I need config TTY. And if I want to have screen and keyboard to work, I need to have config VT. And if I want it to be the console that is not on a serial, I need to have config VT console. If I want to see something, I will need to have config VGA console or another hardware console. For serial, it's a little bit simpler. I will need the TTY and I will need the config serial 8250 and 8250 console. For keyboard on the screen, I will need config input keyboard, config keyboard, ATK, AT keyboard. 
I can add all kinds of things and to actually make use of it, I will need an init that does something, but I don't have to because some things on the kernel actually um, parse uh, configuration, uh, parse input and do things with it. For example, magic CSRQ key. Okay. Now, if I want to have user space, I need to be able to execute binaries. And for that, if I want to use the Linux standard execution Linux format, I'm going to use config bin format elf. And if I want to execute scripts, I'm going to do like the init that I generated, config bin format script. Now, what if I want to have more useful applications? Then I would want to go and have like proc if I want to use simple utils like ps. I would need to populate slash dev in order to use device drivers and so on. So here you can see we had config this, config that, and there really is no end to it. But at the end of the process, you can have all kinds of displays and it's really nice. Now we don't have time for the next subject, I believe, but I'll go very quickly on it. The, what I show uh, is the continuation of it. And if it's interesting to you, um, maybe subscribe to like a YouTube channel that I I prepared last week following the previous post nor talk and I will add explanation about it. So about the graphics, there are different graphics modes and different graphics modes if you want to make sense of them. For example, this is with support for VESA. This is support only for 16 uh, VGA. Then this is support that also has frame buffer. You can see very pixel uh, penguin here as the logo. Basically, there are all kinds of modes and you will need to configure them as well. Good way to see if something works is to cut something to the frame buffer. Here you can see, for example, VGA frame buffer. And here you can see a um, higher resolution and higher resolution like in VESA. So there are all kinds of parameters. I can center the penguin. I can, uh, I can go and decide if there is takeover. I can add more hardware and so on. But these things tend to be quite um, complex sometimes. So for this, um, you need to first know the hardware, second, have patience, and third, probably use a build system like Yocta project, which I talked about in, a, in the previous week um, with the, in the lightning talk. And I put additional YouTube videos that elaborate on what I did in the lightning talk. And in addition to it, what I also did, uh, what I also will do is actually, if you care enough about your project and need it, then I have an online course that I teach in two weeks from now, something like this. You can look at the website and contact me for that. So what we have is a graphical distro that we did. And one more thing that I had is, let's see, I will change slightly the, Distribution, I want an init RD. And I will remove the no splash. So I can see like a splash screen used from P splash. Okay. I'm the great graphical designer in the world. And we can see that this is like a way where I use like the screen, like from user space, utilize like the frame buffer. So I can go ahead now and use P splash. Now I terminated the QEMU and that's it. So there are a lot of things you can do and I hope I gave you like the taste for it. So when you want to build things, you may really want to build system. And build systems usually do quite pretty much the same things that are going to have all kinds of metadata that you will parse in order to do very common steps like obtaining the source and building cross tool chains, obtaining the Linux kernel and building it, same for Uboot, other bootloaders, configuring packages, building packages, uh, unpackaging packages, uh, creating a root file system, uh, creating all kinds of tools for flashing and so on. So Linux build systems, um, the idea, and with this I'm going to finish the talk, will be to take a host that is on the left side and somehow answer this question mark, resolve it and create everything that's on their target. And Yocto is one of these build systems that does it, okay? So now I will not do a demo for Yocto, but Yocto has this metadata, as I mentioned in the previous lightning talk, that do the phases that I mentioned, like fetching packages, 
configuring them, patching them, compiling, packaging, creating GERD FASS, testing, and preparing for deployment. And as I mentioned, if you want more information, then um, there is under um, this YouTube channel or in the playlist, okay? Like it's still too new. I need to make sense of it. Sorry for being old fashioned. Um, this is not how I make my money, okay? So you can see over there and the slides will be available and you will have all the repositories organized together at one slide uh, tomorrow. And if you're interested in more information, then these are going to be the next courses that I'm going to teach about Yocta project, about kernel development, and about uh, Android automotive, and Android security, and all kinds of other goodies. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. And I wish you all um, good health and a lot of happiness and hope the world recovers and gets better after this uh, corona problem. So thank you for listening and watching. Thanks a lot, Ron. Um, there are some questions that have uh, come in. Some, I believe, you have already uh, answered in your talk. But uh, uh, most people just say that they appreciate the content. It's really great. There's a question here. When is the next kernel course? And are there any kernel training labs documentation available from you on demand, either paid or free? So they are both paid and both free. Um, the next kernel course is it May, I think. Um, oops, what did I do? Yeah, so there is a planned course at May 4. But the idea, what, what happened is that I was living a I was most of the time like uh, in Singapore, um, like last year, and I came back to Israel where I live now and plan to do these courses in Israel and they became online. So schedule has changed a little bit, but the next course is going to happen in, in May probably. But because schedule and flights have changed, then if there is like a particular need, just Talk to me and maybe we can arrange it also like another day so on flexible hours. Like, you know, everybody's working from home, those who are fortunate enough to be able to work at these days. So I'm super flexible. Just email me and like, uh, we'll see uh, what's done. Thank you. Great. And uh, I believe it's worth mentioning also that uh, you were originally meant to have uh, a training day out at the physical FOSS North event, right? Yeah, so I hope, and first of all, we'll do it in November, but hope we will do it with FOSS North uh, also anytime soon. Like we are able to do the one day Android automotive uh, course, uh, we're able to do it online because I was going to use all kinds of emulators anyway. And um, so talk to the FOSS North organizers and we'll be very, very, very happy to, to do that. And by the way, for those who want uh, the Linux Foundation, I work for the Linux Foundation. I'm training partner of them. Now they have like really, really big discounts on training. So if you want them uh, for online training certificate and all that, then I can hook you up. I can get you like best price and so on. Like you can contact them directly. But like if you, I mean, they cut it by like half, I think, something like that. So it's not such a bad deal right now. And then there is kernel courses also. Really nice. Uh, then there was a question about the GitHub URL uh, yeah. and the slides and so on. But I guess you, you already said that you will uh, uh, put everything in the slides and have a link to it. Uh, yeah, yeah. I just want to emphasize one thing. Um, uh, so, OK, so it's not telling you. So there, there is the kernel config one. And there is the, the there is the script and init RAM FS and RAM disk and all this kind of thing that I did. And the URL for that may change because I could not fork a project for myself. And I did not want to rename it because uh, I did some talk at the Linux on, at the embedded Linux conference last year. And, and it was on different things. This is what I said at the beginning, that they give different focus. And I did not want to change the name of the repo. Maybe I will. I will decide after the talk what I do.
Okay, so okay. this will be available. Yeah, really nice. Uh, then there was a question from uh, from the YouTube audience. Uh, when you type make dash J16, what is the meaning of the J16 argument? I believe it was answered that it's the number of uh, um, of concurrent uh, jobs that make create. Do you want to yeah. elaborate on that? Th that's true. Now, basically, the idea of it is going to be um, something like this. Like, if you look under proc CPU info, this is like the guideline, and it's like not exact science. Then you're going to have like a, a number of like processor packages that you have, like physical <laughs> things that you buy like at the store and put it like uh, on the processor socket, put it on the motherboard, and then you may have several cores per processor, and then you may have like a hyperthreading or not hyperthreading. So the guidelines is usually to make best use of your machine, to take the number here, the higher number that you have here, multiply it by two. It's like you have hyperthreading. But there are, it's a guideline. It's not exact science. Many times it's a bad idea. And I'm not going to get into it uh, now. It depends like also when and where. And when I say bad idea, then in notorious systems like um, the Android open source project, uh, if you don't have like super strong computer, then you know it's not going to end up very nice for you. You're going to need to read new somewhere else. Okay. Yeah, yep. I, I have some memories of my own trying to compile Qt WebKit uh, with not enough RAM, which is a similar experience. Um, there was another question here. Uh, I loved seeing how, how the flow of, of the kernel boots. Is there a way to see this flow of functions that boot up, how it goes through on a particular system? Is there a way to trace it somehow in a high level sense? Yeah, so that's a good question. Do I have time to demonstrate? I'll do it very quickly if I have. Like uh, the idea is like the easiest thing if you have a hardware debugger or QEMU um, would be to attach a hardware debugger or QEMU. And then, so I'm going to show it like here and, and just like put breakpoint in like a way, go ahead, debug a, this guy, a VM Linux, for example, okay? And that is like a, the, the source code without, okay, now I'm, I'm going to assume that they have a time and then I'll be focused on this. So, so um, it's going to be the kernel with, with the, the parameters. And but basically what I'm going to do is connect to my target. This dash SS, this is what it does. And then I can go and put breakpoints, let's say in start kernel or in B uh, rest in it or in B and uh, 0x1000. Okay, I made a mistake somewhere. And I know why I made a mistake because I did not boot it with no KSLR. This is the mistake. Um, so the addresses that I put it are, are, are incorrect. Actually, it's like it's a good example. Okay, but you you'd say that the general uh, the general tips is to to run it in QEMU and and use GDB or a similar de debugger to, to yeah trace. yeah that's the general tip. However, however, the que it's a tricky question because what is considered boot in x eighty six actually in ARM it's much easier in x eighty six there is something that is annoying for GDB, but it's workable. And that when the kernel boots, it boots in something called 16-bit real mode. And when the kernel itself operates, it's in something called protected mode. And everything that happens before is a little harder to, to get. But the thing, the reason why I wanted to demo thing is that it's like so easy. No, target I wanted to do, target. Sorry, uh, target remote. Okay, I missed something. I just don't know what I missed. 
Yeah, it's right. about an okay SLR thing, but never mind. Like uh, maybe, maybe I can we can put it in, in the notes after afterwards when we put them up on uh, when we put the slides up and so on. Yeah, so maybe it's good to cut this part. I think <laughs> I could put a hardware debugger, but uh, like to do H break. Ah, no, no, I know exactly what the problem is because the symbols I did KSLR, but these addresses are not true. Um, basically, if you look at proc uh, uh, KL sims. And you will search for the value of it. Let's say start kernel. Uh, okay, I removed it already. Then you see that it's different. So now what I need to do, like, is reload this, and then it will be okay. Okay, but I'll do it later if I have time. Are there more questions? Uh, no, that was the last question actually. So I think okay. in that case we are we are more or less done. Or if you wanna if you wanna show just the um, the capture of the um, kernel unit. Of ah of the kernel in it, yeah, or the the GDB session you had going. Yeah, so I need to actually have a look because I don't know KSLR is what I should have done for sure. Um, let's have a look. Okay. What happens to it? I think I need to have an, an, hard, an harder break or maybe Okay, there is a good chance I'm not running the same kernel when I think about it. So never mind. I mean, it it will take me like one minute, but like uh, that I'm doing it like while we are at it, it's not um, it's not ideal. So I think we're go it's better like to to conclude here. But like uh, those, the, whoever asked the question, I'd be happy like to like answer it like immediately like after the talk. Okay. Yeah. Great. Great. And uh, thanks again for a really good talk. It was super interesting to see things in, in more detail than you would usually do. And uh, with that, I will hand over back to Johan. Thank you. And with that, I would like to thank our speakers, our sponsors, and all our viewers 